Good morning, everyone. This is Blonde Lay from the CDBG team. Um, we'll get started here in a few minutes. OK, and it looks like um, some more people have got in, so we're going to go ahead and start now. Um, good morning. This is again Blonde Lane from the CDBG team. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday and I'm excited to start our first J update of the year. So before we get started with our GA update, um, I have a few housekeeping um, updates. So this GA update is provided with Teams Live. While you're using Team Li Teams Live, you will not be able to use your audio or video. Um, to ask a question, please use the chat function. Um, if you're having any issues connecting, please contact Matt Wakefield, um, and here's his email. And to use the ask a question function, um, here's the guide on how to do that. Um, so select Q&A on the right side of your screen. Um, the Q&A panel only appears if the organizer, organizer has set it up. Type your question in the compose box and then select send. Um, if you want to ask your questions anonymously, you can, um, but you know, it, it's a little bit, sometimes it's a little bit easier if you put your name, um, if it's a specific question, so. And then for to receive credit for this GA update, um, you'll just have to fill out the form again. And I'll go ahead and put that in the announcement section now. So okay, so you should be able to see the announcement, and that'll have the check-in form. 
Um, and I can also send it to you after this um, update if you are having issues clicking the link from the announcement section. So. So over the course of this update, we'll update you on the following. So CDBG team, the community affairs staff, strategic initiatives, and then grant services. So to start off the with the GA update, we have a message from Christmas Hudgens, the CDBG director. Christmas. Thank you, Balan Lake. Can everybody hear me OK? Thumbs up if you can. I'll I'll proceed as if uh, as if I know. But uh, anyway, in, in lieu of an icebreaker today, we just I wanted to take a moment um, to just share some thoughts with you. As, as many of you know, I, I hope you know me by now. My name is Christmas Hudgens, and as Belanley mentioned, I am the CDBG program director, the relative still relatively new CDBG program director. But uh, I started with Okra. It'll be five years um, on Friday, I think. Um, which feels like uh, has gone by in, in the blink of an eye, but uh, I, I previously served as community affairs manager, which means I had the privilege of leading up the community liaison team as, as well as the honor of working alongside many of you um, one on one in communities uh, providing TA throughout the project development phase of, of most CDBG and other OCRA funded projects. So I just wanted to take a moment um to share with you how much we appreciate what you do um, a talented grant administrator is a vital part of any community project whether you are part of a regional planning organization or whether you're a freelance consultant grants like cdbg are an important source of funds for most communities and so a grant administrator is a key member of, of any project team and we understand that you have a wide range of responsibilities in within that role. Um, as a grant administrator, you don't just help communities fund their important work, but you make it possible for them to continue or to even expand their efforts to address the needs of their residents at a high level. Um, that kind of work can be incredibly rewarding because you get to serve causes that speak to your values while affecting change on a local and a regional level. Your conversations with Okra and with local leaders around important community development issues and opportunities have such a positive impact on our rural communities. So whether we're talking about infrastructure projects like sewer, wastewater, drinking water, or emergency services, fire EMS stations, downtown revitalization projects, community facilities, whether we're talking about strategic planning or um, piloting new programs to better serve communities, it, all of these um, are important pieces of how local leaders are addressing need within their community and you're, you're a part of that. And so as we continue to navigate the emerging needs of communities post COVID, your role is more important than ever. Um, communities need administrators like you to help achieve their goals. And uh, we know that you have shown true dedication and determination without your support as a state. We, we couldn't have gone that extra mile in the last couple of years. So we're just truly grateful to have good partners like you, and we wanted to make sure that we very intentionally took the time today to just say thank you to each and every one of you. I'm excited about what's to come. I'm excited to lead the strategic direction of CDBG from here, um, and I've heard a lot of good feedback from, from all of you on how you think things are going and what opportunities you think might exist for communities in the future. Um, and so I'm excited to, to keep those conversations going, but uh, that that was really it for me. I just I wanted to pass along those thoughts and uh, hopefully they're meaningful to you. And with that, we can uh, kind of dig into some of the specific updates we have for you today. Ah, round one and quarter two planning. I know you've had a lot of questions about uh, not so much when we're going to open because those dates have been on the calendar for a while now, but more specifically what uh, what specific programs are going to be open uh, for quarter two planning. Um, we are going to open back up for public facilities plans, uh, economic development plans, environmental assessments, feasibility studies. 
So you've got a bit of a wider range of available plan types for communities. Uh, that program will reopen on March 15th for applications. Um, of course, you know site visits are not necessarily a requirement for planning, but we certainly do encourage you to take advantage of the technical assistance that is available to you. Best way to ensure that you're able to come in strong and competitively uh, with a planning grant application is to tap in um, to your CL, uh, who is an invaluable resource to you. And of course, we provide strategic support from here in Indianapolis, so feel free to reach out to us anytime as well, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. Uh, for round one, uh, round one is going to open up on March 22nd this year. Um, eligible programs will be wastewater drinking water, uh, public facilities with the exception of historic preservation, uh, stormwater improvements program and blight clearance program. So that is what we are looking for for round one. Um, we are going to be making formal announcements, of course, but I wanted to kind of give you all a heads up so that uh, as you continue to talk with and to plan with communities in anticipation of those rounds opening up, you had a better sense of uh, what was going to be available to them. So Balame, can you move forward to the next round or the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, we are in full swing for the 2022 action plan. Um, we have active stakeholder engagement going on. Some of you may have been contacted um, by our consulting team at Root Policy Research. Uh, here is a link to a survey. Um, you can share this with any of your communities. The CLs are going to be sharing this as well, but we do want to hear from you. Um, all of your input is utilized uh, to determine uh, any proposed changes within the action plan. Uh, we have a convenient little QR code here as well that will be available. That first draft will be available um, for inspection for an opened up for public comment prior to its submission to HUD. Uh, let's see, when are we doing that? March 7th is when that draft is going to be available. So Monday, that's coming up soon. Uh, we're going to have that posted on our website on the CDBG uh, consolidated plan and action plan page. Um, we will also be making a statewide announcement with all of this information as well, so you know exactly how to access it and where it will be. Um, the action plan will be up at that time in conjunction with that announcement. And then, of course, we'll have public hearings um, to collect additional public input on any proposed changes within the plans. So uh, you will have the opportunity to attend those hearings and to provide comment. We're going to have two. They will be hosted virtually, so there'll be one at 10 a.m. and one at 5 p.m. on March 21st. Uh, so again, we will send out the formal public notice um, in conjunction with the, the action plan draft, but I wanted to give you a heads up so that you knew that was in full swing and so that you could be out on the lookout for it. Next slide. Just a couple helpful notes and reminders. I do see the question in uh, the chat about uh, changes uh, related to procuring engineer either before or after application or award. We are looking at that. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback on the move, uh, moving procurement for planning after award to after award. We are still strategically assessing that requirement as we are collecting feedback. Um, so there will be no change for this round of planning. Um, but we are actively looking and collecting input and comments on that particular change so that we can assess whether we will want to change that moving forward. So uh, just not enough time to get that done before we have to reopen for quarter two. So uh, we will also be adding a field. One of the things that we've been asked to do um, by HUD is to keep better track of what the match sources are. Um, within the application record in eGMS. Right now, there is no way for you to denote exactly what the match source is for any project, whether it is uh, water infrastructure and you're using SRF or USDA RD as match, um, or whether you are using local cash on hand. Uh, but we are looking at a way in GMS to add a field where you as the grant administrator can denote the match source. You would do that at application, of course, because at proposal you may still be ironing out details. So uh, we'll have more information on that to come. I imagine it is something that we will address at the site visit with you for any round one proposals. Um, but just to give you a heads up that that is a likely change that we'll be making within the application itself so that we can keep better track of where the match source is coming from or where the match is coming from for projects. Um, another reminder, 
Uh, grant admin fees are capped at 8% of the total project cost for both planning and construction. So budgets need to reflect that accordingly, um, regardless of the match requirement for each program. So with planning, for example, uh, if the match requirement is 10%, in the admin column of the budget, we should only see if they're going to use their local match to cover admin fees. We should only see 8% of that match in the admin column of the budget, and the other 2% um, would either need to go to direct project costs or uh, would need to be in a separate line item within the budget for some other project related activity. So just keep in mind um, we will be enforcing that as we move ahead. So if you do need TA on uh, how to build that budget, let us know. We'll be happy to take a look at it before the application submission. Um, and then we've already talked about the procurement piece with planning. Um, we'll continue to look at that and we'll keep you up to date on any potential changes related to when procurement for planning will occur. I appreciate all the feedback that we've gotten so far. Um, I just want to make sure that we are being deliberative and thoughtful in assessing that input um, before we try to implement any changes too quickly. So I think that is all from me and I do not see any additional changes or questions in the live Q&A, so I'm going to hand it off to Community Affairs. Let me make a quick note here because I see a note in the chat. Yes, that is correct, and it is a, an important nuance. If the community is paying local match, you can always negotiate to uh, to be paid more than 8% of the total project cost. It just has to be anything over that 8% has to be carved out and cannot be paid for with any Oak Grove grant funds. So thank you. That is an important nuance. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the community affairs staff. Um, if for those that you for those that know that we've gotten some new staff on the community affairs team and I just want to list them all out so that you all know and that you're aware. So um, first is the community affairs manager, Neil Elkins. We also have the West Central um, community liaison, Sarah Froderman. Uh, Northeast, Ali Daughtry. Southwest, Jill Hahn. Um, Jerry White. Of course, he's been here for a while, <laughs> senior community liaison and Northwest. Um, our East Central position is uh, vacant. And then we also have um, on the Southeast, Kathy Dayhoff Dwyer. Um, so um, if any of the community liaisons are on, um, we'd love to just um, have you introduce yourself and uh, maybe talk for a minute or so about you know your role um, as a community liaison and uh, what you hope to accomplish. Well, I'll get started. I'm Jerry White. I'm the North, or excuse me, the Northwest uh, Community Liaison. And as Belanwe so graciously said, yes, I've been with the agency for quite a while. Um, I do cover 17 counties uh, from Lake County over to St. Joe down to uh, Clinton, Tippecanoe, and Warren counties. Uh, but I have been called to service uh, some of the other regions as we've gone through some transition with the community liaisons. Uh, very happy to be able to help if you have any questions. Uh, again, thank you for this time. I'm Sarah Froderman with the West Central area. I go from Vermilion to Fountain Montgomery over to Marion, down to Owen and Sullivan. So that whole area there. I've only been with Oak Ridge since November, but I'm very excited to be in my role and looking forward to just getting out there and and meeting the communities and seeing how I can help. Thank you, Sarah and Jerry. Um, we'll go ahead and move forward to the next slide. If there are any other comments, yes. OK, so. And we also just wanted to wanted you all to take a look at the uh, new CL map. Um, some of the regions have slightly changed, um, so um, the new map should be posted on the website, um, but here's what it looks like now. Okay, so uh, 
the GA training, um, CDBG 101 will occur April 5th and April 7th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, it'll be two parts this year. Um, so current grant administrators will not receive continuing ed credit for attending CDBG 101. However, you will be able to receive continuing ed for attending the other GA training courses. So this would be similar to last year. Um, the registration link can be found um, on the slide, um, but it is on the grant administration certification page on the OCRA website. Um, for updates on future dates, um, please see the OCRA calendar. Um, all those dates are tentative um, and we are strategically assessing those. Um, so. Um, yes. And then also um, we have the GMS technical guide. Um, it has now been released, so it is uploaded on the GMS resources page on the OCRA website. Um, the technical guide is um, it, it will show you how to do most of the administration processes that um, grant administrators are required to do. Um, this guide will assist you um, with. Um, it will act as a, a tutorial um, for some of those processes and a guide, so um, please utilize that. Um, also, um, the ER handbook will be uploaded this month as well. Um, so um, that is a part of the overall CDBG handbook um, overhaul. Uh, we will be we plan to update the actual CDBG handbook um, this year. Um, and then also I wanted you all to note about the website updates. We are also uh, working on updating um, the okra website as a whole um, and making it a little bit more user friendly for you all um, so look out for those um, we do in the um, if you notice on the the update registration form or the uh, yeah the update registration form i have a question for you um, please answer that question um, it's not required but we're just trying to see what type of forms that you all are using and um, get rid of some of the forms that are not being utilized on the website, so. And now we have a recovery housing update um, with that, Wakefield. Thanks, Bonley. Um, so for those of you um, who are unaware, um, we received two special allocations from HUD, uh, specifically to target recovery housing. Um, for temporary um, housing assistance for uh, those dealing with substance um, use disorder. And so we have funded the first uh, two projects, uh, each receiving uh, $600,000 each, the cities of Butler and Martinsville. Uh, so with those will be hopefully starting soon, breaking ground um, as soon as they get through the entire process, um, we can providing services uh, to those community members. Uh, as of right now, we don't know if we will receive any more funding for this pilot from Congress directly. Um, however, we are interested in seeing uh, feedback both from the communities um, and grant administrators on how this recovery housing process is going. It is potentially something that we might explore um, providing more resources to from our general allocation as well. It's something that's near and dear to um, Lieutenant Governor's heart. Um, and has expressed interest in it. And if it is something that's viable and of interest to our communities, uh, we want to make sure it's something that is potentially available uh, to them as well. So um, stay tuned for any updates on that, but um, that is moving forward. Um, this does not clear the allocation entirely, but it is pretty close to being um, all of the allocated funds to us. So we are still deciding uh, what to do with the a little bit of funds that are left over. Next slide only. Um, so the next thing that is on my uh, agenda for you all uh, is a do a tutorial walkthrough for our GMS uh, income survey, um, I guess module that we have now. Um, so if you, um, with this comes some changes to our 
uh, policies. So we will be posting a policy update um, to our income survey process just to give you kind of a quick overview of what that is um, and what that should be. Um, so for the policy update, and spoiler alert, this is not going to be required to do income surveys in GMS for round one. You can still use the old process um, as part of that. This policy would not go into effect until June 15th. However, as you'll see with the GMS process, it will be available to you um, when round one opens. The minor changes that are as part of that would be the amount of time available to conduct the income survey, and then obviously the response rates from us at OCRA uh, to move forward, and then as well as um, essentially codifying it as you will have to do it in GMS moving forward from the effective date. Um, outside of that, very little will be changing in the policy, and we did want to note um, that old income surveys that were completed and are valid do not need to be moved into the GMS system, um, and you can still use them for the valid time that they are available. Um, so with that said, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough and show you kind of how the new system will function, kind of the advantages of doing it uh, within that system. So you should be able to all see my screen. Um, this will look relatively similar to what you see. Uh, this is in our sandbox, so it has changed just a little bit for you all. Um, the biggest thing that you're going to see is you'll have a new button up here, which will be income survey or income survey requests. Um, and this is where you can go to access those income survey requests. Oh, and great timing for me. <laughs> Thank you. We need a technical difficulties thing to show up right now. <laughs> and I just need to log in. All right. So we do have our income survey request button that you'll have. This is where you'll be able to access all the income surveys that you've started. Um, however, this is not where you will go to request to start a new income survey. Um, that will be a module that is going to be right here at the bottom of your screen. This is only going to be available for GAs, uh, anyone with the GA profile. And so to start it, this is and again, all of this is just moving into GMS. It's not really changing the process or anything, um, any of the resources that we have available to you. It just is just putting it all in GMS um, so we can um, eliminate all of the emails back and forth that we've been, uh, that you are probably as tired of as we are. Uh, so this will just put it all in one place. Uh, so anyone who's done the um, application at this point will know that you just use basic search. You'll find all the communities in this case, we're using our test town of Colette. And then we'll also use the geography type. So this is, you'll use a pick list and select from the HUD um, or census approved boundaries, which one you are using to show that your community does not qualify. So if it is the town itself, you'll put in the town. If it is the block groups, you'll do the block groups. You can also list, so we encourage you to list each individual block group that you are using. Um, so if it was for Allen County, um, I've already have an example here. You would say you're using two block groups. You could say block group three, census track 10, block group four from census track three. And these are the two block groups that you've combined and you found that it does not qualify, but this is the lowest level of geography available. And then we ask that you also put in the number of geographic units you're using. So in this case, it's two block groups. You'll just put in here that it's two so that we can make sure that we know um, uh, that we are calculating correctly on our end. And then finally, you'll also put in the LMI based on the HUD mapping tool. And so this is what you've calculated based on these two block groups and their populations and their LMI. Um, if you need to go to the HUD mapping tool, you can go right here and it will take you to the latest edition. And in this case, we'll say it's 44%. 
Um, this is an important button that you'll need to click or not click. This shows whether the service area conforms to that HUD boundary. So basically it's asking, are you doing a custom service area or is it fit into these block groups entirely? So essentially if you're selecting these two block groups, if I select this button, it's basically saying that everyone inside these two block groups is going to benefit from the project and that's my service area. If you've carved out certain streets within these block groups, then you would not click it because of the custom service area. And then we'll ask for the downloads or the uploads essentially um, of the service area. We encourage you to add these here. Works just like the previous process. This still is in beta testing, so we are having a little bit of issue of getting it to show up on this, but we'll show you in the next phase uh, what that looks like moving forward. Um, so hopefully this will be fixed in the near future, but you'll be able to see all the files that you have uploaded um, as part of that. So you'll go ahead and submit it once it's complete. And you'll get this note saying, thank you for your submission. You can expect a response within 10 business days. And then if you want to do any more, this just automatically resets. And much like your applications, you'll go to your income surveys and you can see the status as well as access the income survey. And then these are going to be some key dates that auto populate as you go along. So we can see, and when we go in here, that it has been submitted for review and you can see the files that you've uploaded and where it is in that approval process. Uh, this is everything that you will be completing as part of the income survey. But you don't need to worry about that until we get there. So I'm going to go ahead and approve it on the back end. And when you refresh, it should update to the next phase. So I do want to point out real quick, oops, in the income survey request, it has auto populated this new date. So essentially the time in which from we approve it at OCRA and to when you should submit it as a completed income survey, uh, you have 90 days. Uh, so this is a auto generated date. If for whatever reason it's going to take more than 90 days, we encourage you to please reach out to OCRA. It will move your survey to on hold. It doesn't reject it automatically. So you will need to say why it's taking longer, what the conditions are, um, but this is just so that you know this is the date in which you have to submit it for approval. So you can, if you want to, go through this entire process. You can edit these, put the number of households in the service area, um, but we have included an update record button and flow. Uh, that we encourage you to use, at least for the start of it. Um, so it asks the population of your service area, since it is those two block groups combined together, you should know that just by adding up those the low mod universes. And then the number of houses inside your service area, so essentially your entire list of households that you will be surveying um, as part of the process. So every household in here, so let's say it is And then it gives you the number of people that you're going to put in for your um, into the survey monkey calculator. Obviously, with a non custom service area, this is going to be pretty easy to come up with because it's just going to be the low mod universe. Uh, but it provides a link to the survey monkey calculator. And you can go ahead and put in 400 people with a margin of error of, we'll say 10 in this case, but you'll need to calculate what your margin of error is. And it gives you a sample size of 78 people. We still ask that you take a screenshot of this and you'll upload this here. So you'll put in the results of 78 people and then you'll upload that screenshot. And then finally, what you're going to do is put in the um, the income limits based on what HUD has released. And this needs to go from the start of your income survey. So even if you submit it for approval or as part of this process, um, 
this needs to be the income limits that are you're using when you start your survey, meaning this is when you um, reach, make that first point of contact, the first mailing, the first door you knock on. Um, so if these need to be updated or changed because you didn't actually get a chance to start your income survey until the new limits go into effect, you'll need to reach out to OCRA to get these changed. But you'll go to the CDPG resources page, find those income limits, you'll put in the county or metro statistical area, and then add in for each one of these. I'm going to fill it in with some dummy data or placeholders. You'll obviously use the correct ones. And then this way, OCRA will be able to see and match it up and then approve this for your income survey. And then as part of this, it will automatically calculate the number of people per household, the number of households in theory you would need to reach out to to start. Oops. And then we'll display those income limits for you. So once you have all of those um, included, as well as your one upload for the screenshot, you can go ahead and submit for approval. And this is essentially OCRA saying your income limits are correct when you start this income survey, as well as we have found that the service area makes sense and your calculations are correct uh, for the number of people that you actually need to survey for the survey process. So you'll submit that for approval. It goes back to this screen. Um, and then at this point, we would then approve it within those 10 business days. And then you could go ahead and get started on that income survey um, that you have as part of this process. So once you have done the income survey and completed it, you'll go ahead and put in all of the dates and or all of the um, information that you normally would um, for the income survey. Um, and this is everything through the end of it. So the important thing to remember is that as part of this process, um, you want it to be complete. So you'll see when we go to this update record, again, you can fill in all of these individually, but we encourage you to use the update record. Um, you'll put in your income survey start date when you finished it and then include the number of families. And this is all the same information you're using off of the worksheets. None of this has changed. Um, so all of this will be based on the things that you come up with. I'm going to change this just so that it shows that you actually met the income survey um, so it's over 51 percent so it would be a valid survey and then you'll put in these i'm going to put in placeholder data again but this is just the descriptions and everything for the narrative portions of this that we would expect in the application you'll just be putting this in right here as part of the income survey itself so when you use this income survey in future applications if you're using it for a planning grant and then using it for a um, cdbg construction grant you only need to do this once. And then you'll upload all of the things we would normally expect to see. On the back end of the income survey, you're going to do this all beforehand. Um, your list of families, the certification, uh, the sample versus the total list, and the survey responses. And you can go ahead and put in all of your survey responses. That way you don't have to do anything in FEEPS afterward. It can just be, um, uh, it can just stay here uh, inside this record. So again, this just says that once you submit it, you'll hear back within 10 days. And this is something to note too, but if you do need to change this, you can still change all of these. Say you put this in incorrectly, and the actual number is 21 versus 89. You can change that here in line. The reason that's important for this case is if you do hit the update record and go this way, you will need to re-put in all of the information once again. So it's just either or, um, but we 
recommend using the update record to start. And then if you do need to edit these in line, probably want to do it this way, or you can start all over with the update record. Um, all of your files will stay here though, once you've uploaded them. And then you can finally submit for approval. And throughout this process, you can always check in your list view, the status, as well, and as well as this completion date deadline. Um, once a their survey has been approved, uh, this will auto calculate and auto populate. So I can show you that. Just let me approve this on the back end. And so then once it has finally been approved, you'll see this full record of everything that has been completed. So you can always reference it um, if you need to find the LMI for what you calculated um, when you're filling out the R applications, as well as any of the files um, that you've uploaded as well. These will automatically keep here. And then this date in which the survey is valid um, will populate on the record as well as in um, this request here. Um, so you'll notice that it's in the future because we said that we are starting the income survey on 3.8 in the future. It's auto-calculated that from the date in which you put in that you started the income survey um, to add five years from that date. So this is the time validity. In the back end, you don't need to see, you don't really need to know all this, but there are a number of um, calculations and validations. So essentially when you are going into the application, much like when you're finding a planning grant that you previously used, you'll just be able to select that from a potential list. Only valid surveys will show up. So you cannot use an invalid survey. If it's gone past this date or it's not been approved, it will not show up in that field. So it's something to note. So if you're still waiting for approval, obviously if you're going to do an income survey prior to the um, submitting of the application, that income survey will need to be approved before you can upload it or before you can select it. Um, so again, we have 10 business days. Try not to wait to the very last moment. I know we're always gonna try and work with you um, through those processes. We don't want communities to be, um, uh, to be penalized by any reason, uh, by any means, if it's something that we can work through, um, but we do need a little bit of lead time to approve these surveys. Uh, so don't wait till the very last day or the last minute as part of that. Or if you have it coming in um, and you know it's going to be close, let us know beforehand uh, so we can be uh, aware of it and make arrangements on our end uh, so that if it's valid, we can get it approved and you can select it. Um, so all of these will be able to show up um, on your income surveys. So if you've completed it for the client, it will also show up on the client itself. So in the town of Colette, in their records, they will also have a list of their uh, valid and approved income surveys. And then once they have reached this five-year point, uh, they will just, the status will change to expired and they will no longer be able to be used. So that's a quick run through. Um, this will be available for every grant administrator um, to submit those surveys. Um, if you, it will go live before round one. So if you are doing a round one income survey and want to go through this process to have the income survey in and uploadable, um, so you don't need to do anything behind the, um, uh, behind the scenes, um, you know, we can go ahead and do that. But if you still want to use the old process um, until, uh, this, the effective valid date goes in uh, to effect, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. So, And the other thing I do want to note as well is that um, we, oh, did it go to, Paul, do you need to add the? Yes, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just re-add the PowerPoint again, so. Okay. Um, so the other thing to note is that the um, income survey um, oh sorry I've lost my train of thought looking at the comments sorry about that um, so I 
think that covers everything from an income survey. Oh, the one thing I do want to note is that we will be doing a more detailed walkthrough um, that will be posted uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, so you can watch a walkthrough there as well for different scenarios, um, as well as doing some income survey trainings. I know we've teased this for a very long time, um, but getting into more of the nuts and bolts um, of some examples of, I know um, some people have asked of uh, exactly what those look like for those um, list of families um, in that process. So um, what those look like um, as part of that process. So we'll go ahead and um, have those updated as well, um, hopefully for the, for sometime around round one as well. Thank you, Matt. Um... So I just wanted to point to two things. The first thing is that um, the these new policies will be posted on the website for you all to review. Um, and then the second thing is this GA update is recorded, so you will be able to at least review the tutorial that Matt provided today. Um, and then we'll also be uploading the PowerPoint for today as well, so. Um, and then for questions about income surveys, um, please um, email me or call me. Um, I'd be more than happy to assist you with um, a request for an income survey. And then any questions related to GMS should always go to Matt Wakefield. Um, and then here's his information right here. So now we have Dee Dee Leonard from the off the strategic initiatives team with the update. Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Dee Dee Leonard. Um, I am with Strategic Initiatives, which is a group that was born um, approximately one year ago to kind of help tackle a lot of the um, projects that we have going on outside of CDBG. So this is just that update. Um, Blondley, you can move to the next slide. Um, as I said, I'm Dee Dee, and some of you may know me. I was previously the West Central Community Liaison, and then I moved into this role as Senior Program Manager for Indiana Main Street in October of last year. Uh, the rest of our team includes, some of you probably also know Andrea Kern, who was um, previously our Northeast Community Liaison, and she has um, been in the role of St Director of Strategic, strategic Initiatives um, for about a year, and uh, also heads up HRGP. And then we also have two newer staff members, um, Abby Huff, who is our Outreach and Organization Manager with Indiana Main Street, and then Alex Taylor, who is Community and Economic Development, who primarily right now is leading the health effort. Can okay, go to the next slide. So this is just a quick dip update on Indiana Main Street. We've been working hard to try and bring our program um, up to both the current accreditation standards for Main Street America, as well as the newly announced accreditation standards that will be coming to us um, officially um, by the end of 2023. Um, in addition to that, we are also working to get communities to adopt the Transformational Strategies Program. Um, so we are working towards that as well. We have um, trainings occurring for eight of our nationally accredited communities over April, May, and June timeframes. Um, we currently are also in our application process for new and communities who are looking to graduate to our next level. Um, and that application process is actually getting ready to close. Well, the applications have closed, but we are in scoring right now and we're getting ready to announce um, our new communities and our graduated communities. And that will be the first week of April. The annual reports and assessments are underway. Um, all communities are expected to have the reporting turned in by March 4th. And then of course, we're continuing to engage um, communities more and more through email, um, Facebook. We've really ramped up our Facebook exposure and our social media to kind of help get communities talking to each other, talking to us more. And then we also have technical assistance um, that we are offering communities more and more um, and more trainings coming. You can go to the next slide. 
Uh, the next program that our team is working on is the program the um, Alex Taylor is primarily leading, and this is our um, Hoosiers Enduring Legacy Help or program, um, which is help. And this is basically supporting communities um, by building capacity, creating network, um, and this primarily directs to, or uh, ties to the ARPA funds that communities have been um, provided. So right now um, we do have four uh, what we call cohorts as part of this program program um, of communities that we're working with to help get them the the resources that they need and as you can see here these are the updates on those cohorts um, and then Alex is also working working on um, an ARPA funding toolkit FAQs um, and then a strategic investment plan And then um, a couple other updates on our, some of our other programs. So some programs that some of you might be um, aware of, interested in is our Historic Renovation Grant Program, HRGP. So we are going to open that again this year. As with last year, this will be a competitive process again. Um, it does open on July 6th. So the only um, caveat to that is that we do have a certificate of approval process that does have to be completed as part of this application process. Um, this is completed through um, DNR, so and they do have a 90 day lead time. This is a, this is a kind of one of those things that we can't get around. This has to be done by application. Um, so it's very important that if you know of someone who is interested in pursuing this application process, that they are working to achieve that certificate of approval um, immediately in order to give themselves enough time to have it ready to go by July 6th. And then finally, our Rural Opportunity Zone Initiative, so Rosie. So the purpose of this project is to build the capacity of rural-based opportunity zones. Um, and participants in Rosie are preparing to present their investment perspective in the uh, Rosie planning team. And then the um, Rosie planning team led by Purdue and uh, Center for Regional Development is putting together a development course that will train community leaders. Um, on how to create that prospectus. So um, lots of stuff going on in strategic initiatives. I think that's it. Thanks, ZD. OK, and so now Adam insisted on this photo. <laughs> so um, Adam, you have the floor. Hello, Grant Services. We have a couple of updates uh, to share with you guys. Um, you go ahead and jump to the next slide. Just can't touch this. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, first of all, Grant Services does have a new staff member. His name is Bryce Gorman. Um, Bryce will be working on a lot of different things, um, particularly right now we have him working through monitorings because we know we do have a lot of those in our in our backlog. Um, and he's also doing some award prep. Um, so if you communicate with Bryce, please reach out, say hello, welcome him to our team um, and let him, let him know anything that you could help him out as being a new staff member with Grant Services. And also just a quick reminder that the close help, the closeout process is now all in GMS. Um, you will go in there and do a report like you'd be doing one of your release of funds reports or something like that. There you can, there's a new closeout report in there. It's very simple. Um, the only thing you need to remember is you should put your final beneficiaries in on your admin page before you do that closeout report. Um, you will then submit a closeout form one, but that is submitted with your monitoring materials. It's not submitted to initiate the closeout any longer. It's submitted with your monitoring materials and it does have different things on it than the previous one did. Um, and then your closeout form two will be submitted after your monitoring. Um, there is no longer a closeout form three because we realized it said the same thing that closeout form two did. Um, so if we, those new forms are updated on the website and if you need any help with that closeout process, um, the, the we do have some instructions for that, so please reach out to Grant and Service Grant Services if uh, you need any assistance. And I'll jump on over to Michelle now. The, thanks, Adam. And just want to also note that this new process is in the GMS technical guide as well. So if you need um, a guide on that, it is there for you. So, um, Michelle, thanks, Blondley. You can switch slides, please. Yeah, sure. 
Hi, everybody. Just wanted to um, say thanks again for joining us this morning. Um, so we have some updates on labor and uh, some modifications. So I'll be going over fringe benefits, apprentices, and when does David Spigen not apply, and then the modification requirements, since those have been coming in pretty quickly, um, and a lot of them lately. Go ahead and move slides, please. So we've gotten a lot of questions on fringe as we go through construction. Um, monitoring and I wanted to give you guys a little heads up here. So bona fide fringe as far as um, DOL is health, wellness, dental, vision, life insurance, pension, 401ks, sick leave, holiday vacation. Those are bona fide that are always going to be um, approved in eligible fringes. Anything other than the above will be considered on a case by case basis. So as you guys are filling out your wage fringe benefit forms, just make sure you kind of check what fringes are in there because we will be. Um, so if they don't apply, you may have less fringe and might not meet your Davis Bacon package. So just be aware of that. Drug alcohol testing programs, SAT, are ineligible. We have uploaded a resource guide. It's just a guide on to the CDBG resources page under labor standards. It's a fringe resource. It's the last bullet point on that page and the revision number um, date is March 2022. It is a long PDF, so please download that. We will be using that as we go through um, it is a resource. HUD DOL does not provide a hard and fast list on which fringes they will or will not um, approve as eligible, but we are conservative in the way that we look at fringe. Um, again, bona fide fringe, those in the blue on your screen are will always be eligible, but anything other than that, just kind of have, just think about that before you decide to add that all into fringe because we may pull it out depending on um, what what the allocation is for, the contributions for. So take a look at the fringe resource when you have some time. Hopefully that helps explain some questions or um, things like that. So can we go? And I just want to also a caveat union fringes, just so you guys know, are not always eligible. I think that um, was different in the past. So we've gotten some new information. So we're updating that process as well. Um, next slide, please. So when you're going through your fringe, you kind of want to ask yourself, does this contribution benefit the employee? Does this contribution benefit the company or corporation directly or indirectly? That's kind of what HUD DOL thinks about as they're determining fringe eligibility when they're doing audits or for labor standards. So as you're going through it, that may help determine which fringe you actually let your contractors know that's not going to fly. So let's let's do something else um, or cash fringe or whatever else that what they need to do uh, to make it up. Next slide, please. Apprentices, um, on the right hand side, not all certificates look like this, but this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, a seal or, or something, or maybe there's usually a letter that comes that says that they have been approved and certified in uh, an approved apprentice program. So make sure they have the, we have that as your within your monitoring files. I've been seeing a lot of registration forms lately. Um, so we'll be looking for this instead. Also, um, just a little note about appren apprentices. If they're not classified on the payroll as an apprentice, they will be um, given the full journeyman rate. If they're not in the uh, an approved apprentice program, they'll also be given the full journeyman rate journeyman rate. So just so you wanted to want to look out for that, make sure that those are on the CPRs, the classifications on the CPR, and you have your documentation. So you'll need your collective bargaining agreement that tells us how much the apprentices are supposed to make, um, what fringes they're allowed, and that's what we'll go off for apprentices. So just wanted to give you guys a um, just a reminder on that in case that was unclear before. And next slide, please. So Davis Bacon doesn't apply to demo projects or standalone to standalone buildings and planning projects that don't require technically skilled laborers that are not. So that doesn't the so DB doesn't apply. You will not need to submit a construction release status report for that. However, the contractors that you do hire to do the demolition will still need a SAM.gov and you'll still need to look up the HUD limited deniability. So please um, include those in when you're uploading your forms um, for ROF. And next slide. Okay. Restitution payments. Um, there is no minimum limit for restitution. I know that there has been um, some 
Pox about $9 or $5. I just want to let you guys know there's no limit, no minimum limit on restitution. So if it's seven cents, um, your employees will need to be paid the seven cents of restitution. Um, continue to provide your certified payroll reports that clearly indicate the amount was allocated for restitution, either on a line item or that payroll. Make sure the cop, if you have copies of checks, make sure they state they're for restitution with a signature or a document that says the state the employee has received those funds. Um, if you cannot find, sometimes it happens where you have restitution payments because we haven't monitored for a little bit, um, then restitution needs to be paid a year later after the, the project is over. So when that happens and the contractor is unable to find those employees, you want to make sure that you provide a copy of the restitution payment, a letter from the contractor saying they've made multiple attempts, at least over four that were made over 30 business days to contact this employee. If you're unable to find the worker, um, please let us know and then we'll guide you from there on out. Um, and a reminder for restitution, overtime pay, at one and a half and straight fringe is required. Um, so don't forget to look at that as well. Um, we just had a DOL update, digital payments, things like Zelle, Cash App, PayPal. You can make those payments to your restitution payments to your employees using those, those platforms. However, you'll need to get documentation that you've done that. If there is for some reason fees associated with using those, I think PayPal has like a 10% or something like that on the dollar, then you'll need that will be charged to the contractor. So that will be have to be added because that could take your fringe down. Just wanted to give you a heads up on that if that's something that your contractors want to do in the future or if it's the only way to find an employee that doesn't work for them anymore. Um, Modifications. We're getting a lot of category ones for time extensions. Please submit um, a written explanation from either the CEO or the project engineer and the project engineer dated and signed on letterhead, current progress, the reason for the extension, the new timeline, what they're going to be doing for that timeline, and then use contract two, the form two as a guide. There's some document, there's some wording in there that needs to be on each of your letters. And if you could submit these in a relative amount of time to process, being mindful that a lot of um, completion times or uh, deadlines are the same date for everybody. So when they come pouring in, it, it, it gives me a little bit more time to, to approve those and move them through. And I guess we'll move on to John. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Making sure everyone can hear me. Uh, so I just wanted to let everyone be aware that moving forward for our next round of grants, um, there's going to be a change in our uh, FEPS process for the civil rights. The fair housing poster uh, is actually getting an update. Uh, Based on some information, it was actually updated in June of 2018. Uh, so we are going to start asking for all grants moving forward for the next round. Use the updated uh, fair housing poster. We will have that updated on the Okra resources page. Uh, so uh, it won't be right now, but in the next uh, week or so, when you go, you will when you click on the fair housing poster, it will no longer show the brick outline poster. As you see in the left, it will have this new um, new ish uh, fair housing is law poster, which you see on the right uh, and it will be what we will start requiring and asking for for the FEPS process moving forward. Uh, so if you have a grant out right now and you've already are working on the civil rights, we will accept both. However, for the next round of projects, when it gets to the civil rights portion of the FEPS process, we will be asking and requiring the uh, current fair housing poster, which is the one you'll see on the right. Uh, and then as uh, just as a reminder, all civil rights documents will be required during the FEPS process up front. Uh, and I know in the past and previously we had reviewed that on the back end. However, now we are asking for all that to be supplied at the front end, including the notice of section three report. I know we've gotten a lot of questions about that, but that documentation, the notice of section three uh, poster along with fair housing and all the other forms will be required on the front end. Um, that way we can just review that at, right at the front and get that checked off. Thank you for your time and please let me know if you have any questions.
Alrighty, good afternoon, or excuse me, good morning, folks. This is Tim Parthen. I just had a very quick update on environmental review. As you can see on the slide there, we did have another contact change, um, this time with USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NARCS as I like to call them. As you can see, the prior contact was Rick Nielsen. He left at the beginning of this year. So uh, moving forward for ER consultation with NARCS, you should be sending your ER documentation to John Allen. His uh, email address and phone number are listed there for you. Um, as you folks know or may not know, you do need to give your agencies up to 30 days to respond to your request for consultation. Um, if you've sent everything to the prior contact and you didn't get a kickback, or um, they didn't forward it off to another party at USDA and that 30 days has passed, you don't need to reach back out to USDA NARCS. If you sent something over to them within the past 30 days, you haven't hit that 30 day mark and you're still waiting for a response, please forward your old requests over to John Allen to make sure they have it. Again, you've got 30 days uh, that you need to give those agencies to respond. If it's been 30 days already and you didn't get a notice from them previously that he was no longer there, you can go ahead and move on. If you're still within that 30 day window for them to respond, please make sure you forward your request to John Allen, the new contact at USDA NARCS. We can move to the next slide. Okay. Thank you, Belanley. I also just have a very quick update uh, regarding national objective and specifically um, how we're determining beneficiaries and um, meeting eligibility for the LMI area benefit national objective. Uh, you know, the LMI area benefit to el be eligible, you must have at least 51% LMI persons in your service area. Um, what we've noticed in our applications as we're going through and doing threshold reviews is there is a bit of a discrepancy on what information folks are providing and that also depends on whether or not they're qualifying based on HUD census data or they're doing an income survey. If you're conducting or excuse me, if you're just using HUD census data, uh, for example, your town is coming in the service areas, the entire town of Ulitik and you see that the map indicates they're 53 percent LMI. You'll see in the HUD mapping tool you have low mod univ. That is your total number of beneficiaries in that service area and your low mod PCT is the LMI percentage we're looking for. If you're coming in using multiple geographies, so this is if you have um, a utility service area, for example, that doesn't quite conform to the town or city boundaries, um, but it does fit within say two or three census blocks. You can combine that census block data to get your LMI. Um, you would take the average of those and assuming you met the 51%, your project would qualify and meet the national objective. However, it gets a little more difficult to determine the estimated number of beneficiaries. So at that point, we may be reaching out to you for some additional documentation, whether that's um, a justification letter explaining who the beneficiaries are, or if it's something more complex involving a specific utility, we may need something from the utility or the engineer. Um, and we'll address those as they come up during application rounds and we'll work with Okra on, on some of those questions as well. Uh, if by chance you're using an income survey, Matt has already gone over all of the key things to watch out for and how to do that process. When you're in the application, um, I, this may change because we're going to be linking the actual income survey records to your application in the future. There is a field where you will put the HUD census data and you'll also provide the income survey data if you're trying to meet the national objective through an IS or an income survey. Just make sure when you, if you're doing an income survey, give us the HUD data up front from the mapping tool and then later on in the national objective section, you're going to give us the income survey information and you'll see it's line 15 and 16 from the income survey worksheet. I believe it's actually called the LMI worksheet. And then uh, when you get later into the application, it does ask specifically for your estimated number of beneficiaries that should be coming from your income survey, not the HUD mapping data. All right, well, thanks Tim for 
that. So uh, thanks Grant Services for giving that update and really thank you for uh, the entire team um, for helping put this together. Um, so for this G update, we had a few updates from the CDBG team, the community affairs staff, strategic initiatives and grant services. Um, right now we're going to open it up for discussion. So go ahead and um, take a few minutes and um, if you have any questions, we'll, you can put those in the chat. OK, and I'm not seeing any new questions on the chat. Um, I want to ask the CDBG team and the rest of the team in general. Um, did you have any final thoughts? To share. Hang on one second, Milan Light. I think we're trying to answer. The question related to the uh, bidding advertisement. I want to make sure everybody sees it. We I've, I've this is Adam. I've added it to our list of things to review. We will try to add the SAM component um, to the requirement for the bid update and we will look at the um, bid package and stuff that goes out to update some of the other things. And I know the section three form is still um, outdated on the thing that we have online, so we will work to get all of that updated to our current standards. Awesome. Thank you very much. And then I posted the attendance link as an announcement again, so. Thank you. Blondie, there was a uh, question saying, will slides from today be available on the website? Yes, um, so they sure will. Um, the slides from today will be uploaded as well as the recording. Um, just give us a few business days, um, but it will be up there. I'm going to go ahead and just because we had several questions about it, uh, about the 8% um, for on the admin. Um, for planning grants, what we've noticed was it, uh, we do require a 10% match of the total project cost. Um, what we've been seeing is that full 10% is being put in admin. Um, the, the cap for admin is 8%. So while your 10% match does have to be there, the other 2% has to go into your plan, but you can charge more than 8% for admin. However, anything over 8% will not, is not counted as part of your local match. It will be ineligible. So you have to have 8% um, in grant admin, and then your other 2% needs to be in your plan. And if you need any clarification, please feel free to reach out to um, myself, Adam, Michelle, and Grant Services, and I'm happy to discuss it with anybody. And that question about subcontractors in the chat as well. Balanle, can you do a quick review of the continuing education process, the CEU process? Yes, um, so for continuing ed, um, essentially um, what we look for is um, education that's under the justification of uh, will this improve uh, a grant administrator's role for specifically a CDBG program? Um, that process is evaluated. We look for um, live courses. Um, there are a select amount of HUD courses 
um, that can be taken asynchronously, um, but um, those need to be emailed to me um, prior to um, taking those courses. Um, so uh, I, I all the most of the continuing ed classes on the website are aggregated from other grant administrators. Um, so what's on there is mostly from other grant administrators. Now, if you see a live class um, that you are considering taking or a webinar or virtual, whatever you want, would like to call it, um, you can send that to me. Um, and then um, once that class is take, once that class is sent to me, then I'll evaluate it based on that justification I just mentioned, which is how does this improve um, a grant administrator's role as as um, to carry out the CDPG program. Um, and then based on that justification, I'll give you the amount of credits that it's um, eligible for. Um, typically, um, it will not go over um, three credit hours. Um, you can also use conferences um, for continuing ed. It really just depends on, on how it fits in that justification. Um, it's very, very um, dependent on that. Um, and you can view all the continuing ed on the uh, grant administration continue ed page. Um, that is also where you will view um, the recordings of the GA update and the PowerPoint slides. So um, if you have any other questions about continuing ed, just um, feel free to send me an email or if you'd like to have it answered now, you can send it in the chat as well and I'll follow up with you. I would also add that based on a lot of the feedback we've received from you all, at, we are looking at ways um, at expanding our continuing education offerings um, that would potentially include some interactive lunch and learn style trainings with grant services um, to unpack nuances and the mechanics of specific admin pieces where it would be beneficial for you um, and then with okra on different front end pieces related to maybe application development scoring criteria um, national objective, eligible activity, things of that nature. So we, we've heard you saying that you want some uh, additional continuing ed options and that you would appreciate the opportunity to do that in an interactive way with a grant grant services. And so um, we are looking at different ways that we can kind of add that um, to our menu of options for continuing education. So I'll we'll be excited to share more with you uh, about that once uh, we have more details. And then we just got a question. Um, someone asked, how do they um, prove their attendance? So if it's on the continuing ed page, um, you do not have to send me an email um, to prove your attendance. Um, the only time that you would actually need to prove your attendance for a continuing ed class is if you are audited. Um, and we typically do an audit, a yearly audit. Um, so um, just retain all your documents that prove that you um, have taken the class. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, any other comments from the team?
And some of you are asking how many GA credits is this update? And it is one. Um, you're required to attend at least two GA updates a year. Um, we will have at least three GA updates this year. So we typically do not have more than three for the year. I think Michelle is answering one more question related to blight clearance and Davis Bacon and whether Davis Bacon is required for remediation activities. Yeah, I'm looking at that right now. So remediation activities, it will be dependent on what the project is. If there's asbestos happening, if you're just uh, demoing a building and you're not nothing else is happening or it's not attached to another structure, then no. If it's attached to another structure, then yes. Does that help? Hopefully. Um, if not, just feel free to email me and we can talk about it some more. Um, but that's just a rule of thumb. Any other comments or questions? And it looks like Michelle is taking care of um, one of the, the questions that we have over here, but um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you all for um, attending this GA update. Um, we hope to see you soon. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to any of us.